Let's talk about DuckTales, a show that aired back in 1987, a brand new type of show that was head and shoulders above the majority with its animation style. The story of Donald Duck, who had just taken custody of his lesser known nephews, Huey, Dewey and Louie, but as Donald left to join the Navy, yes, this is all part of the original Disney canon storyline, he left the nephews in the care of the dollar coin swimming Scrooge McDuck, the richest duck in all the world. And because of this, they would go on constant treasure hunting adventures together, which, as you already know, is the perfect recipe for a kid's TV show with one hell of a catchy theme song. DuckTales was huge, and I mean seriously huge. It was the first obviously Disney-based TV show to be picked up for a weekly scheduled release, and it paved the way for many other Disney-themed TV shows, such as Rescue Rangers, Tailspin, and of course, Darkwind Duck, and plenty of other shows for many, many years. This all became part of the then well-known two-hour-long Disney afternoon block, which reran the previous show Gummy Bears for a short while, or at least in America it did, and that paved the way for Disney Toon Studios' first ever theatrical release movie spin-off. It obviously got a remake in recent years, along with plenty of merch, comic books, and of course, you got your video games too, which just so happens to be one of the most well-loved Disney video games of all time. And that even got a remake too. There's no denying the absolute admiration for anyone that has ever come into contact with this series and today on The History in the Games, the show where we take a deep dive into everything from Popeye to South Park and the mask to Family Guy, we're going to be going back to the beginning and looking at the history of the most infectious 1980s and 1990s franchise for all ages, that is DuckTales, The History and the Games. And guys, before going ahead, let's quickly chat about Smash TV, or to be more specific, the It's Showtime challenge that I'm putting out to all of you guys to beat. That's right, not only have I created a complete history on this Smash TV franchise, link above, but thanks to Antstream, who are this video sponsor, I have my very own tournament going on right now, and if any of my followers beat me in this particular challenge, then I will personally send them the I Defeated Slopes Game Room pin badge in the post. <laughs> I'd buy that for a dollar. <laughs> you don't need to. Not only would I send you the badge for free, but you can also play the game for free too, as and stream is now free. Of course, if you want adverts to be removed, there's a small monthly fee, but regardless on however you decide to play it, everyone watching has the ability to kick my ass in this challenge. It's just a shame that none of you are good enough to do it. All I ask is that you sign up using the link below, which basically tells the good people at Antstream that I sent you, and on top of that, make sure that you follow me on the platform, DJ Slope. Whoever is at the top of my follow list by midnight on the 21st of October gets the pin badge. I'll be recording my attempts to beat you guys live on Twitch and on the second channel too at this time, so make sure you come along and check that out. And finally, a massive shout out goes out to Amiga Square, who got this through the post for kicking my ass last month on Metal Slug X. Thanks for the support, mate, and hopefully I'll see you all on Thursday night. Anyway, let's carry on with the video. In the August 1986 issue of Television Radio Age, a monthly trade magazine that provided coverage of up-to-date information on the world of TV and radio, Robert Sobel goes into detail regarding the oversaturation of the exploding popularity of kids' TV shows. 
12 to 15 brand new shows are incoming. Some of the already popular shows are getting even more episodes added and the very best of the best kids cartoon shows are getting movie adaptions. He goes into detail explaining that the very best shows, aka the ones that are actually going to last, are the ones that actually have great characters within rather than having cartoons based on originally created toy lines. I mean, sure, there are always exceptions to the rule. Shows like Transformers have always been popular and the studio that produces them can get away with asking for anything up to a three-year contract for new episodes. But what about the toy lines that ended up being a fad or simply just did not stay as relevant as Optimus Prime and his crew. It was a risky and very hard judgement call to make for TV execs that for the most part never made any money out of the toy sales. All they cared about were eyes on the screen. Do they remove a show like, say, Thundercats that was doing perfectly fine in place of something that's new, that's being sold as the next big thing and sign that deal for, like I said, up to three years? Or do they expand the time slot of kids' TV shows and in turn allow for more kids' TV shows? Obviously, they went for the latter. And in this very article, it shows off just some of the shows that were lucky enough to get hold of these new, higher-paid TV slots. Danger Mouse, Ghostbusters, Silverhawks and Defenders of the Earth are all taking centre stage in the larger than ever cartoon filled afternoon blocks, which have more eyes on the screen than ever, resulting in the most expensive ad breaks ever for cartoons. And one of the newer companies that are jumping on board to this new afternoon block of cartoons was a little known company known as Disney. And it's in this very article that we got to see one of our first ever mentions of the upcoming show, DuckTales. Now, of course, some of these shows are still driving the sales of action figures like the animated Rambo and My Little Pony shows, but character development and humour was once again starting to become super important, just like it used to be and should have always been. If you want good, long-lasting characters that will stand the test of time, then you've got to put the effort in. Disney were pumping some serious money into this new afternoon block TV show, the one with the most high-paying adverts. Way more than the competition, in fact, and the way they were doing this was surprisingly actually farming out the animation duties to another studio called Wang Film Productions. Now, Wang Film were not the guys that were going to be doing stuff like... I don't know, Hulk Hogan's Rock and Wrestling. These were the guys that were responsible for some of the episodes found in shows like Popeye and Son, Snorks, Flintstones Kids, and The Jetsons. Regardless of what you think of these shows, the animation at least was noticeably better than the majority of its competition. And let's face it, Disney had a pretty big reputation to uphold. And sure, even though Wang were obviously not Disney movie quality, they still definitely pumped out some of the better looking shows, but because of this, they cost the most. And Disney paid that price. They were more than serious about the ever-rising popularity of kids' TV shows, considering this was about the time that the company as a whole wasn't doing so great. It's hard to imagine a time when the almighty mouse house wasn't buying up every major company or IP under the sun that it could get its hands on. And sure, there are a lot of reasons as to why Disney was struggling during this time, but in a nutshell, one of the best examples I like to give to really get you in the mindset of what Disney were like during this time was the film The Black Cauldron. Legend has it there was once a king so cruel and so evil that the gods feared him. Since no prison could hold him, he was trapped forever in the form of a great black cauldron. The old king, that black-hearted devil. A beautiful movie that had a $44 million budget, and it was beaten at the box office by a movie with a $2 million budget. That movie being the Care Bears movie. Yeah. As stated, there's a lot more to it than that, but Disney were making mistake after mistake after mistake, it seems, and uh, it wasn't actually until a certain red-headed mermaid would come along to save the day that really turned Disney's profits around. But that's a story for another time. Was Disney yet again about to make 
another mistake? Michael Eisner, the CEO of Disney, definitely did take a bit of a beating from hardcore fans and historians for farming out these animation duties to this third-party studio, most notably due to the fact that it featured one of the company's most iconic characters. Of course, Donald Duck was really only a cameo in all of this, but who cares? How dare Eisner give away these heavily established characters, yet keep shows like The Wuzzles and The Gummy Bears in-house? Thankfully, this backlash led to even more money being pumped into the show and for Wang Film to get even more animators onto it too, as the $20 million 65 episode run became one of the studio's biggest efforts up to this point, and thankfully... It paid off. The show was an instant success. Sure, you still had haters like the Los Angeles Times seeing this as a really bad move for Disney. The absolute pioneers in hand-drawn animation for the last 60 years by that point, creating less than Disney quality content and getting overly hardworking Japanese animators to do it instead. But moan all you like, DuckTales was a success. And sure, in hindsight, it's very easy to look back and see what was going to work for Disney and what wasn't going to work. But to put you in the mindset of what Disney and people that were looking into Disney were actually seeing at the time, Michael Webster, the vice president of Disney Animation Studios, had this to say in an interview. When we started, the yen was at 240 to the dollar. It's now at 143 to the dollar. So our cost went up 40% just through shifts in the currency. It's not cheaper for us to do it over there, but they have a talent pool of fantastic draftsmen that we don't. We have some talented artists over here, but nowhere near enough to handle the massive amounts of footage we need, and the work ethic in Japan is phenomenal. They all work 6 day weeks, and probably at least 10 hour days. Some of them work all night. I've gone into the studio in the morning and seen guys sleeping under their desks, it's unbelievable. <laughs> If you guys are surprised, you're not alone. Before researching this video, I had no idea that so many Western-created shows, or what I believed was Western-created shows, were actually being created by a Japanese animation house. I had no idea, especially DuckTales, the show with the most infectious cartoon theme of all time. Introducing Mark Muller, a struggling musician who had finally managed to get his first hit with Hearts Nothing At All, and with the success of this track, he was able to get a meeting with Disney themselves, who just so happens were looking for someone to create a not-so-typical TV show theme with a catchy pop hook that would give off the sense of adventure. He went home to his apartment directly above two mostly deaf old ladies who live beneath him, thank God, as without them he may not have had the courage to scream out the iconic a woo. <laughs> the entire theme song was created in only 45 minutes. The race cars, the lasers, the aeroplanes. It was a serious duck blur. And one of the funniest things about researching this is that Mark actually has a fair few hits under his belt that he has written for different artists. When people ask what he does, it's normally followed by, Oh, you write songs? Anything I'd know? What about Hearts Nothing At All? Um... So Rita's It Must Be Love? Hmm, not sure. Amber, Let It Rain? Um, I don't think so. Okay, what about Jennifer Page's Crush? Maybe. How did it go? <sighs> I also did DuckTales. Oh my god, you made the DuckTales theme tune? Ah <laughs> yes, there's no getting away from the popularity of that one song. It's up there with some of the most popular theme tunes of all time. Even Jeff Pasquito, who happened to be the singer on this track, who actually also had a band with some pretty fantastic songs, still has people at his shows come up to him asking him to do DuckTales. Woo! <laughs> And let's set your nostalgia into overdrive, shall we, before we get into the games, because both of these guys also works on this. Anyway, back to DuckTales. The show was a success. It ended up getting a hundred episodes and a stated a movie that actually went to theatres in America too, as well as that more recent remake and a whole lot more. But of course, besides the original theme tune, the most iconic thing about all of this came from video games. 
Capcom had worked with Disney before, building up the relationship as they published the rather sad to look at and play Mickey Mouse Capades, which honestly looks like it was ported from the original Game Boy. But thankfully, any fan of classic Disney video games will tell you that DuckTales was the start of a rather incredible relationship. Takuro Fujiwara was the guy on the case to produce the title in Japan, with designer Keiji Inafune being the designer and Yoshihiro Sakaguchi taking control of the sound. If these names ring a bell, it would be because all three of them were responsible for the start of yet another classic franchise, that being Rockman. Or Mega Man for us Westerners. DuckTales the game introduced many similarities to that franchise in the way that the levels were laid out and the control of the character himself too. In fact, it's believed that the engine used for Mega Man is in full effect right here. And thankfully, it was David Mullick, who is more well known nowadays for his work on such games as I Have a Mouth, I Must Scream, who had not long joined the Walt Disney Computer Software Company and had worked on some budget titles such as Matterhorn Screamer and The Chase on Tom Sawyer's Island, who was looking after the Disney licensed video game side of the company. And the reason why this is all so important to the outcome of DuckTales was because Disney was super important to David. The first movie he saw at the cinema was Mary Poppins. He watched every single Disney animated movie. He visited the parks multiple times each year. And in the job interview, when they asked him to name all seven dwarfs, he had no issue. Seriously? Just try it. Without Googling it, try and name all seven of the dwarves from Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. You're more than likely going to forget one. Told ya. Anyway, what I'm getting at is that both David Mullock and Darlene Lacey, actually, who was the overall producer of this game, were not just doing their job, they were Disney fanatics, confirming every single drawing that Capcom would send their way and even taking the team out to Disneyland and spouting off hardcore facts about each attraction at the end of each ride through. But I guess that's what you get when you enroll in Disney University. <laughs> yes, that's a real thing. A three-day program that new employees at this level must take to immerse themselves in the company's histories, procedures and culture, which of course the two absolutely aced. This collaboration was an absolute match made in heaven. Capcom were obviously brilliant at making games and characters, but for us Westerners, nobody did the story and the design like Disney. The end result is a fantastic game with fantastic characters and fantastic dialogue. Capcom would send over scripts, sketches and constant suggestions on how the game and the characters should feel and the final game really does show that. Of course, this was a family friendly company that Capcom was dealing with so no shooting with guns or laser arm cannons in this game. Instead, they decided to give Scrooge a pogo stick type gameplay element that wouldn't vaporize the bad guys and kill them, but instead just make them bounce off the screen, crosses Robbers he removed from tombstones, I mean, come on, this is Disney, and a few demonic looking characters had to go too. It's all good, clean fun here, that not only showcased how good Japanese created games are when hidden under a thick western coat of Disney paint, something that's a lot more understood nowadays but back then wasn't as well known. But more importantly, on top of all of this, it represented the original source material of DuckTales as perfect as it ever possibly could, with cameos that actually interact with you in ways that they would on the TV show and dialogue that fits their nature perfectly. For me, it's a good game, just so, so much harder to control than you may think. Of course, when you get used to it, it's perfect. However, after playing games such as Shovel Knight, it's very apparent that this original control scheme has come a long way since 1989. But that's now. Back then, this was a huge hit. It got great reviews from fans and critics, so much so that the relationship between Disney and Capcom would continue on with some of the very best titles on both the NES and SNES coming out throughout the years. We invited an expert team to our laboratory to give us their opinions of Disney's DuckTales video game from Capcom. Yes! 
Awesome! You will have exciting adventures helping Scrooge McDuck escape danger and become the richest duck in the world. Cool. Totally hot. Way radical, man. Excellent. Join the DuckTales gang in Disney's DuckTales for Nintendo by Capcom. Also, look for Mickey Mouse Capade. It's a quacker. Oh! This game was of course followed up by a Game Boy port which stays mostly faithful to the original, however does have a slight change up in the level design to keep it playable on the much smaller screen. And sadly the super iconic music has taken more of a beating than it probably should have. But it's again a really solid game that showcased just how excellent third party Game Boy games can be. Besides the terrible renditions of the overly iconic NES music, some people even think that the game is better than the NES original. I don't agree, but still, it does go to show how good of a port this is. And as stated in the theme tune, that history was rewritten with the release of the remastered version of the original DuckTales game. Capcom had the final say this time over Disney, however it was very much a joint decision to pick way forward for the role. Not only was the studio well versed in recreating several hugely popular franchises such as Contra and the stunning Boy and His Blob remake, but on top of all of this the studio was located rather closely to Cal Arts, arguably the most infamous animation university founded by none other than Walt Disney himself and several of way forward's best artists came directly from that institute. It was pretty much perfect. On top of this, Michael Peraza, who was an original animator on both DuckTales and Mickey's Christmas Carol, ended up jumping on board, providing original sketches from the show, giving the animators plenty of resources needing to make the game as great as it could possibly be. But besides the animation, the gameplay itself was again perfect. In fact, during the production of the game, the team would hook up a controller in a way that would allow you to control both games at the same time, and there was virtually no differences. The original voice actors are back from the show, well, the majority at least, and this was done to obviously bring the show to life even more. The end result is what I class as the perfect way to play the game. A few differences are found here and there gameplay-wise, most notably with the bosses, but almost everything else is the same. Well, besides the story. <laughs> Don't get me wrong, I always loved the TV show, but I didn't really need long drawn out cutscenes constantly breaking up the good gameplay. It was cool that the team had the ability to do this, but I don't think it was needed. Thankfully you can skip them in the menu option and continue on your way, so at least that's good. Personally I do wish they fixed the pogo controls a little bit making them more updated, but hey, it's still good fun, albeit a little bit dated when compared to newer games, but that's to be expected. DuckTales Remastered is to many the absolute best version of any DuckTales game in the entire history of DuckTales. But of course, we've gone right ahead here. This is the most recent game and there was quite a few games that came out between the original and the remastered. Starting with the obvious handheld games. Anyway, shall we carry on? Here's the 1990s game, The Quest for Gold. Your mission is to beat Flint Heart in a 30 day challenge to acquire as much gold as possible to continue being Dime Magazine's richest duck in the world because that's all that's important to these guys. It was a home computer game for the Amiga, Apple II, Atari ST, Commodore 64 and DOS computers and consists of several small mini game like stages that are all very forgettable. You collect money by doing all of these random challenges and then go back and invest them into different companies making sure to read up and if those companies are expected to have a good or bad upcoming day. You then sell those stocks and purchase new stocks. Now this may sound like a very boring part of the game and it is, but in order to win you kind of have no choice. 
Now, to be fair, the graphics are pretty incredible, actually, for the time, and the animation is rather stunning, representing the show brilliantly. Overall, though, it's a super forgettable game, impossible to control most of the time, and completely understandable as to why most people do not realise that the game ever existed in the first place. Thankfully, a new game came out in 1992 that was a proper sequel to that original DuckTales game, and it was very odd. Gameplay-wise, it's the same game. The level layout wasn't exactly perfect back then, and it hasn't improved much here. It's still solid fun, and retrospectively, it's essentially DLC for the original game. The exact same engine, the exact same characters in slightly different locations. That's not a negative thing, I suppose. It is just what it is. It's still good fun, but heavily forgotten about for the most part due to the fact that the show had been off the air for a good couple of years by this point, and also because the majority majority of the world had moved on to the 16-bit generation. Still, if you like the original, guess what? You're gonna like this too. Worth playing, just don't expect anything new here. And the same goes for that Game Boy port as well. Which finally brings us to the final game in this entire DuckTales history, and it's the weirdest game in this entire DuckTales history, DuckTales Scrooge's Loot. Of course, we got to end this video on a mobile phone game. It's a Disney property. Of course, you got to be chucking in a forgettable mobile phone game. This one was released back in 2013, and your arch enemy has stolen your gold, leaving you to collect as much as you can in a wait, what? Over shoulder deathmatch game? <laughs> what? Again, I had absolutely no idea this game ever existed, and I would have put money on them creating something completely different than this, almost anything different than this. But oh well, this is what we got. It obviously didn't play all that well on your phone, but hey, you already knew that. Thankfully, the cutscenes were nicely animated with voice acting to boot. It's just so, so weird. Beat up the competition and grab the gold as quickly as possible in a sort of Gears of War meets Disney mashup. <laughs> what a strange way to end the video game section of this video. Now, when you look back, obviously, there's a lot of oddities in the DuckTales video game history. But it's easy to see why that original game was so loved. It was made by masterful video game creators and absolute Disney nuts. And the end result speaks for itself. Many classic fans from back in the day that had an NES often put this as one of the very best games ever released. And when you play it, you can see why. Sure, over the years it's become a little bit basic and unforgiving, but it's still a great game. DuckTales as a whole is still great, as it continues to infect us all with its stupidly addictive theme tune and its great stories. Sadly, the latest reboot of the TV show has also come to an end by this point, but with so much to discover within the worlds of comics, movies, merch, and of course video games, I think we have plenty to keep us going until Disney decide to reboot the reboot. Hey there guys, thanks for checking out the video. Yes, yeah, the part of the video where I'd like to give a massive shout out to all of the Patreons and YouTube members that support the show and allow me to create these particular videos. If you guys want to be able to see videos like uh, the one you just saw early, <laughs> you can do so by checking the links down below and uh, you can see what I'm working on, all that sort of stuff, see early previews, all that sort of thing, get access to exclusive rooms in the Discord channel and plenty of other perks as well. But um, yeah, all those links are down below. Now let's give a massive shout out to all of these awesome YouTube and Patreon members, including uh, Luke Georgensen, Agro Crag, James, Digsy B, Michael Ridley, Dash, De Action, Saxon, uh, Christopher Devero, Roll VP, Jay is Manchild, Daniel Terrazes, uh, Clan Bob, Mike Fallon, Nicholas Burtner, Taylor Rainwater, Dalton, aka Chev Matic, Jabba Al Aden, Benjamin Guy, Man Shovel, Chris the Shapeshifter, Aaron Gorman, Big Rico. 
Coco, Richard Aldridge, Shadow Dragon, Ryan Holtz, Wobbles and Bean, The Wonder Ducks, Game Apologist, Dina, Lucas Softel, Intrigued Gaming, Yell uh, Hamburglar, Jeff Mianowski, Solix Captor, Roven Army, Jeremy Rodriguez, Tim Lunn, Nick Pollard, Bram Perez, Gary Pinkett, Pretendo64, Conrad Constantine, Andrew Dalton, Retro to Next Gen, aka Lou, King Link Reviews, Todd Pool Float G, Tim Labonte, Overjoll Zane, 8 Bit Gamer 88, Ian Quell, uh, Nightwill, Samuel Nilsson, Matt Jackson, Darren Watson, Josh Gibbons, That Gamer, Arista, Dina81, Shade Silence, Mind of the Unsane, Stephen, Cheshire One, Vike Echo, Rocket Blob, The Cunning Linguist, and Man of God 9000. Thank you to all of you awesome people for supporting the show for as long as you have. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And if uh, you guys decide you want to be able to share the video, send it out on social media, Reddit, anywhere like that. All of that sort of stuff really does help grow the channel. So however you guys decide to support me, that would be very, very much appreciated. I can't thank you guys enough for allowing me to do what I do here. So thank you all so, so much. But um, guys, I'm going to end it there because I've already got the next video well underway. <laughs> this is DJ Slope signing out. And hopefully I'll see you all next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>